Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Meeting House live stream. Uh, my name is Jen. You may recognize me from uh, hosting some other times. I am the lead pastor at our East Toronto Meeting House location. So it's really good to join you this morning for worship on the internet. So it's good to have you here. I um, want to start by shouting out our Discord friends. Um, if you want to chat during the service or during the week, um, have people to pray with or talk about lots of random things, you can head to themeetinghouse.com slash discord. We would love to have you join our online community there. Um, we also just want to say a big thanks to those of you that shared in our community online survey that we sent out a little while ago. Um, I hear lots of you fill that out, which is great. And we're going to be sharing the feedback from that survey with you guys in the coming weeks. So stay tuned for that. Um, also, in your email, you may have seen a video from Matt, our interim senior director, and Tonya, our Tonya, Tonya, one of them, our new uh, chair of the overseers, um, in a way forward video. It's about six minutes long. There's no new late breaking information in there, but there has been a lot happening at our church in the last number of months. And so, this is a nice, like, six minute version of kind of highlighting the things that we've been talking about, our move forward as a network. And so if you want a more concise way to sort of wait, what is it, what we're doing? What are all the things happening? That video would be really great for you to check out. Um, it's just really lovely to see what's happening and moving and changing in our church family. And although I'm a part of the East Toronto Meeting House and most of you are probably a part of our online community, unless you're like homesick or something, um, we're all part of one big Meeting House network family. Um, and so it's exciting just to be a part of this bigger community and to know a little bit of what's happening and what our way forward is. So if you haven't watched that video, I invite you to check that out whenever you can. Um, before we get into our giving today, I want to share a little bit. Um, I think previously, maybe on this live stream or maybe um, on our Common Room podcast, I talked about an organization I was partnering with uh, this winter spring uh, called Funding Love. I'm actually wearing my uh, t-shirt. And so just last week I was in Disney World uh, with this nonprofit that sends adoptive families to Disney to experience healing and restoration. Um, I was a magic maker, so I got to partner with one of the six families that were on this trip and just help them have a magical time. And I learned so much on this trip about adoption, about foster care, about um, some of the trauma that kids and families experience. Um, adoption is really hard and there's a lot of loss and heartache involved, um, but it is, it is love. I saw a level of love um, in the parents and the children this week that I, I haven't seen, I'm going to get emotional, <laughs> that I haven't seen a lot of other places. Um, and it really just, I think, modeled the love of Jesus and the fact that we're all adopted sons and daughters into his kingdom. It was like really on display for me this week um, while I was at Disney with this family. Um, so one highlight I want to share, um, it was only our second day of our six day trip. So still getting to know people, but on our Epcot day, on our second day is sort of when the barriers uh, lifted. And I felt like we went from like surface level conversations to like deeper. Um, so we were having lunch in the Mexico Pavilion, which is super fun. I'd never eaten there before. Um, and just as we were waiting for our dinner, the, the conversations just, just began. Um, I learned more about um, the two little kids that I was with, an eight-year-old boy named Jaden and a five-year-old girl named Hadley, and their experiences in foster care and how they arrived uh, to their mom uh, coming out of the foster care system. Um, I learned more about their late dad who passed away a couple of years ago um, and how hard that was on the kids and how, um, yeah, just, you know, after that, whenever the kids heard that someone was sick, they thought like, uh-oh, does that mean? Um, and just the openness that they were able to talk about life and hard things um, the fireworks show at Epcot that night, there's a new show that really talks about the journey that you go on through life from like starting as a baby and the friends that you make in relationships and then that life also includes deep loss. And we sort of warned uh, the families about, you know, the storyline because for some people it can be quite hard um, if you've recently lost someone. But uh, the mom, Kelsey, was like, no, like we, we want to watch it together. And so we watched the show and... Um, Afterwards on the bus going back late at night, a uh, little Miss Hatley, five years old, we asked her what she thought of the fireworks show. And she's like, oh, I loved it. She's like, the great big fireworks reminded me of my daddy in heaven. And <laughs> we were able to talk about her her dad and, and the love that he had for them and how excited he would be to see the fun that they were having together in Disney World. So that was one day of six. Um, and so I came back um, so full 
um, so transformed seeing, again, like real love on display in the lives of these families and just feel so honored to be welcomed in and a part of that. Um, so it was a phenomenal trip and just a real reminder that when we give of ourselves, when we are willing to serve the whosoever in whatever place we find ourselves, God can do incredible work. Um, whether it's in your, your local community, at a food bank, or at a nonprofit you love, or whether you're sitting in the middle of Disney World with an adoptive family that has said, yes, come with us for this week of our vacation and, and we'll share our lives with you. It was such an honor. Um, so thank you to those that were praying for me. Um, I'm excited to share more about this trip with my own community in East Toronto as I continue to process. Again, I, I only came home a few days ago, so there's still so much to process and talk about, but so grateful to God for this opportunity to minister with a group that I love. I love kids and families, and also I love being at Disney World. So it, it seemed too good to be true, but it was such a wonderful experience that, that I had um, serving in this way. Um, so at this time in our service, we're going to move into our worship and giving. Um, as you guys know, when you give, you support the ministry of our church. So things like this live stream, um, our, our teaching that happens, all of the ministries that we're a part of um, is all fueled by the giving that we give to our church. We are the ones that, that make this nonprofit fly, um, just like every other nonprofit has their people that give so generously. Um, this is how our church uh, lives and thrives and breathes. And so we just thank you so much for your generous donations. Um, you can give online right now if you want to. I won't be offended if you go to another webpage, um, or you can anytime during the week at themeetinghouse.com slash give. Um, let me take a moment to pray for our offering for our service today before we get into our musical worship time. God, thank you so much that you are a God who loves, you are a God who forgives, you are a God who restores. God, thank you for the opportunities that I'm sure many of us have had in our lives where we have seen you at work, we have seen the love that you have, that we are all adopted sons and daughters into your kingdom, God. And with that comes great joy, comes great healing, comes great restoration. God, I pray that as we um, celebrate the gifts that you have given us, God, that as we give some of those back to the work of your church, God, that you would take it and use it to provide further healing and hope and restoration to those inside of our church walls and those beyond our church walls in our communities um, locally and also around the world. God, we thank you for this church and the ability to worship together, whether we are um, on an airplane, in a hotel room, in our living rooms, in our PJs, God. Thank you that um, we can worship you wherever and whenever. We just pray that you would be with us now as we continue to worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's jump into our musical worship. our time together in service this morning. Let's make this our prayer. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to
It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all celebrate with one more song? We're going to do it anyways. I just wanted to get a feeling of consensus, like we're all in this together. That's right. Yes, guys. Come on. I was buried my shame who could carry that kind of weight it was my turn till I met you yeah. I was breathing but now My failures I've tried to hide. It was my turn till I met you. You called my name and I.
save my soul. Yeah. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old man. Jesus, when I About a decade ago, I was with a friend who was a fierce apologist and theologian within the Anabaptist tradition, like not a pure Anabaptist, but definitely Anabaptist leaning. And he was one of those guys who just always had answers, like a ready defense for the the faith. And because his ability to answer so quickly and so wisely, he, he had such a skill there. He was invited to all sorts of conferences. So I had the opportunity to go down with him into the Southern United States and watch him at a Veritas uh, forum lecture at a university. Um, and he was invited to debate another very well-known reformed brother who uh, really opposed a lot of what he taught and wrote and theologized about. And so like, I remember traveling down there being like, this is like Mike Tyson and Riddick, but like, this is a fight. This is going to be something. And sure enough, it did not disappoint. So they got up there and they're in suit and ties, ready to go, all of their notes spread out. And they just like, Thought. Like they, they were swinging and swinging and swinging. My personality, I was like, whoo this is spicy. It is going good. Like they're getting after it. And at the end of the debate, I remember um, there were a few of us certainly that came with both camps that were like, that was so good. Like we got after it there. We solved some of the world's problems. But you could also feel a deep sense of heaviness in the room. So just because we thought like, this is fun and exciting, you could feel the palpable lack of energy and the weight of two brothers who call themselves part of the body of Christ together, who were spurring and sparring and almost like attacking each other's theology. 
And so at the end of their debate, which was about two hours long, there was a uh, uh, open Q&A. And so there was a microphone in each of the aisles. And the typical questions came, what about this? What about this? What about this distinctive of your theology? What about this distinctive of your theology? And then near the end, and actually this is what ended the, the Q&A, this young woman came up to um, the microphone and said, I just have a question. Um, both of them were like, go ahead. Who's it directed at? And she was like, well, it's actually both of you. Like, do you like each other? Because it doesn't seem like it. And you could feel pff, the, the air just sucked out of the room because she was right. You know, it does not matter how much you know if people don't know how much you care. And I remember being like, oh my goodness, this really upset the apple cart here. Like, how are, how are you going to recover? And it was actually the reformed brother who was the punchiest of the bunch um, turned to my friend, this Anabaptist theologian and said, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Please, I confess, if this debate tonight has um, given permission to or suggested that we are in opposition to each other, we've made a mistake. If this debate discussion tonight has suggested that we don't like each other, it's been a mistake. If this debate, uh, our argumentation back and forth has ever suggested that we couldn't sit across a table and share the blood, the wine, the, the bread, the body of Christ, the Eucharist together, we have made a mistake. Please forgive me. This is my brother here whom I sit across from the table with and welcome him with open arms, love him as a brother uh, of Jesus, as a brother in, in, this, uh, in the body of Christ and also as a, as a son of the living God. And then my Anabaptist friend turned to him and said, amen, me too. So how is it that with so much information, so heavy theology, it lacks the power of the, the hope of reconciliation? And how is it that so often in our churches, in our conversations, Christians are known for what we oppose, for what we stand against, as opposed to what we stand for, which should be each other. I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter five, um, whether here in the room or at one of our sites. And this is a pivotal, this is the moment where Jesus, after choosing his disciples, stands up on a mountainside or a hillside, not in the city of God, not in the temple of God, not in the region of God, likely about 200 or so kilometers north of Jerusalem. And he announces this way of being, which is the series that we're um, a part of right now too. What does it mean to follow the way of Jesus? And so just by way of re review where we've been, week one, we talked about, so like, who are we becoming? Like, what is God uniquely calling us to as a church called the Meeting House in this time, in this moment? in this season in the life of our church. And then last week, what does it mean to not just like pay compassion away, but to be deeply invested in the work, the heart work first of compassion and caring for the poor and the other, and then the physical tangible, uh, tangible body work of being invested in to others who need to experience the love of God. And so Laura led us through um, the story of blind Bartimaeus and the brilliance of Jesus saying, what do you want me to do for you, not just give you money. What do you want me to do for you? And how we're to be answering and asking that question as well. And then today, so then, how, how do we deal with our anger or disparity towards each other? How do we deal with and process through um, peace, not just peacekeeping, which is not what we're called to, but peacemaking, mm -hmm. to be people, Christ followers, that create peace with our thought, our words, our heart condition, our body positions, and how we engage with each other. And so this is how Jesus starts out his sermon on the Mount. So if you've heard that before, this is the, the collective body of Jesus teaching that is quite different from religiosity at the time. And so in Matthew chapter five, at the beginning, and by the way, we're coming back to the Sermon on the Mount in a series in the summer. Stay tuned for that. It's going to be awesome. Um, he starts out with a blessing, which is fascinating. Most sermons or synagogue teaching at the time of Jesus ended with blessing. You know, like this is the way we wrap up and hear good words for you to go out with. And Jesus begins, blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are the, favored are the, blessed are you, blessed are you. And then he comes into these principle teaching. He talks first about the law. So what does the law do in our hearts and how does it move us towards godliness? And then the very next topic that he touches on, do you know what it is? Anger a teaching about anger. 
he says in Matthew chapter 5, verses uh, 21, and we'll read all the way to verse uh, 26. You've heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. Full stop there. Um, in the, the socioeconomic, political, and religious context of the time, there was a Jewish, a judiciary court that navigated these kinds of judgments. So if there was a murder, it wasn't the police. It was the Jewish officials who were like, okay, let's, how did it happen? Why did it happen? Who did it happen to? And how do we deal with it? So you have heard it said, or you've heard that your ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to, to judgment. But I say to you, If you're even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment in the same way. Jesus says, if you call someone racha or an idiot or a moron, Jesus is using spicy arresting language right here. If you call somebody an an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court, which I just mentioned, brought before the judicial Jewish court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell or the Greek rendering is the fires of Gehenna, the outside, the pushed outness of God. You're in danger of being outside of the presence of God. Harsh words. So if you're presenting a sacrifice or an offering at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave it there. Leave your sacrifice there at the altar and then go and be reconciled to that person and then come once you've been reconciled to that person and then come and offer your sacrifice to God. When you're on the way to court with your adversary, somebody that you do not like and that you disagree with, settle your differences quickly. Do not let it languish. Anger unchecked goes into the basement and works out. Do not let your differences uh, bubble up. Settle, when you're on your way to the co- uh, court with your ad- adversary, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to an, affi- to an officer and then you'll be thrown into prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you've paid the last penny. Jesus' clear teaching on how to deal with anger, but also how to be restored in a reconciliation process together without just omitting. You notice Jesus doesn't just like glaze over and say, just get out, whatever. It's all good. Just forgive and forget. No, there is a process through which we need to be reconciled to each other. And the brilliance of Jesus mentioning the sacrificial system, which at the time would have atoned for all sorts of sin. Jesus is like, it's not good enough. Leave that sacrifice, that offering, whatever the case may be at the altar and then go and be reconciled relationally to this other person and then to God and then come back and make your offering. Brilliant, brilliant teaching, brilliant, 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 uh, expository, um, exegetical learning from old religious traditions that Jesus is now pointing to a new way. Speaking of brilliant, who is this wonderful gentleman right to my left? Now, Samuel, you are legitimately an expert on uh, peace, not like keeping, peacemaking, the, the work of reconciliation for the body of Christ, and even like um, the political system. You've been active in peacemaking and mediating peacemaking, both locally in Canada, but also like globally in the U.S. and abroad. So like what have been some of your like key experiences and what do you think is the key takeaway while well, you're about to teach on it um, yep. as you've journeyed far and wide? One of uh, some of my experiences, well, what I have learned as I go, tr- as I as God takes me on this journey, is the fact that the word nonviolence, non dash violence, and one word nonviolence, they are two, two different things. Different things. Yeah. And those two words, we tend to equate them even within the church mm-hmm. as one word. Uh, the non dash violence is called peacekeeping. We uh, we just absence of violence, absence of conflict, absence of any disagreement. And for us Canadians, we can live with that. Yep. But the nonviolence invites us to engage the conflict, the existing conflict in a way that is constructive, in a way that is life-given, in a way that leads to reconciliation. So when I demystify, the, when I help people understand the, the distinction between these two words, all of a sudden, I hear an aha moment. Yeah, it's moment. a different game for sure. Because just that understanding enables the church to say, how can we do conflict well? Yeah, it's really good. And in a time and season for our church, I think this is a... A, it's wonderful to be learning from a brother with 
such worldwide experience as you, but also in the thick of it on staff as our discipleship pastor. So I would love for you to exegete, uh, point out some key principles from Jesus teaching here. Um, let me pray for you and then I'll just turn it over to you. Okay. okay? Thank you. Yeah. Jesus, thank you for Samuel, for the ways that you have gifted him to serve and for the experiences that have gifted him to be able to serve and to fully understand and put into practice what you meant and taught in Matthew chapter five. May your spirit dwell within him. May his words be your words and may they penetrate our hearts and minds in Jesus name and together we said amen amen, amen. amen. Uh, thank you so much brother Jimmy and thank you for those of you that are watching online and for those that are present I am really thrilled to be uh, sharing in a room full of people not just speaking to camera but I'm speaking to people that I know people that I love people that I can be able to look in the eyes and say Br hello brother hello sister because uh, when we, brothers and sisters, dwell together in unity, we know and we know, yes, conflict will arise, but in the midst of the conflict, God will give us a way out. But before I get into exegeting these few passages of scriptures, I will attempt to give you a 37,000 foot view of, hey, who, how my call found me. You know, oftentimes we say people, is ch people chase after a call, a sense of call. But in my case, my call found me. Growing up in northern Nigeria, where Christian believers are killed for their faith each year. And, and as I'm speaking to you today, there are more Christian believers that are killed each day in Nigeria than any country in the world. By professing you a follower of Jesus. Northern Nigeria, not the whole country. And that is where I, I, I grew up. As a result of being a Christian minority in such a society, you have a different take on the subject of peace and reconciliation. It shapes you. It molds you. I look back in retrospect, uh, my place of birth, how it has shaped me, even though I did not start because I grew up in a, such a violent world where by professing you're a follower of Jesus, you're staking your, your you're kind of putting your name out there and be ready to be burned to the stake. I did not begin my journey in life in pursuit of wanting to be a peacemaker. So looking back, but all along, God has been kind of in his own way, calling me in ways and putting things in, in front of me, right in front of me that I had no clue. I was living out uh, this life of peacemaking and peace building. Not until, I'm fast forwarding now here, not until I arrived in Chicagoland in 2009 to be a church planter. I arrived this city, it is a city divided, divided by, ge by natural ge geography, which is divided by a river east and west, uh, absolute poverty in the west side, absolutely, uh, there's just one grocery store, predominantly minority, uh, on the east side, like make a pick of your own restaurant. And so I started the glare differences that, uh, that really showed itself up in that, uh, that community. I, as a church planter, I began to ask the question, what kind of church does God want me to plant here? So I took a, the public transport all across the city to pray and really discern the heart of God to plant an Anabaptist church. So while I was really in this discernment process, two white police officers shot a black teenager in the basement of a black church next to a daycare with over 20 kids right next to where this teenager was shot. And you know, oftentimes, as you've seen on TV, when incidences like this, what happened? And when incidences like this happen, what happened? The aftermath is riots, the aftermath is shops burning, and then the aftermath is you, f you see it flashed on CNN, you see it flashed on, on, on Fox News, MSNBC, and all across the global channels. It exposes the divide of that city. That is when I heard a clarion call that I brought you here for such a time as this. I remember saying to God, God, oh, I am not qualified for this. By no means can I do this. And by the way, God, you know, I'm not from here, right? I said, God, I'm not from here. I'm just a church planter. I am here to just plant a church. You did not call me to do the work of reconciliation, reconciling uh, over what, uh, what, about 240 year history of the American racial 
divide an American conflict within itself. Like Moses, I said, God, why don't you use so and so and so? I can go on and on and on and telling you the stories of the miraculous transformation that happens in that city. And somehow I find myself going back to that city like every other month. Uh, the transformation, the work of reconciliation and healing that God has done. And this is simply by responding to a call that God puts in front of you. And as I think about the teachings of Jesus, Jesus was actively engaged in his society and was concerned about the direction for which things were going. He engaged the leaders, of, the leaders of his society, especially the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and the representatives of the Roman uh, Empire. And he attempted to influence them. He, he was actively concerned about the state of those who were being left out. And in this case, those that were being left out, even as we read from this passage, were people that are beginning to wonder. So how do we relate to the people that have treated us unfairly? And reading the gospel with this in mind brings to fore the essential aspects of Jesus' life and teaching. And from our text, you have heard, thou shall not, and I'm not going to read it. So how can we as people who seek to live in peace and reconciliation lived out this particular text, passages of scripture that we have just read? The last I know, according to the gospel record and history, is that in the first century Palestine, that Jesus came and walked in and on was full of conflict. Not different from today. You know, every generation will say to themselves that we think our generation is experiencing more challenges than any generation, which might be true. It is a matter of perspective. When we read in retrospect in history, we realize that the message that Jesus was pontificating, the message that Jesus was preaching was about God's unconditional love. He was inviting people to extend the agape love, the unconditional love that says forgive and love their calling his disciples and say, forgive and love your enemies. He says, pray for them, for, the, for, the, for them that persecute you. Turn the other cheek. Wow. Even when on the night that he was to be arrested on the garden, he told Peter, put away your sword. And remember, even on the cross, on his crucifixion, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. So this call to, to an act of total reconciliation is so compelling that Jesus demonstrated that for us with his life. Paul picked that up in Galatians 5, 20 and 21. Paul taught that hatred, conflict, fits of rage, dissension are all part of the sinful nature. Sadly, we are all prone to conflict. Sadly, this conflict, it, it's often greatest within families, and guess what? Within the family of God's people. So in Matthew 5, 21 to 26, Jesus teaches the importance of maintaining peaceful relationship. God is watching and God is counting on you and I that we can demonstrate to the watching world what it means to be the church. Because the church ought to look different. The church ought to be different. We ought to treat one another as, you know, in Matthew 18 says, you treat them as a tax collector. How did Jesus treat the tax collectors? He loved them even more. Can you imagine Jesus compelling us to treat tax people as tax collectors, but actually he loved on the tax collectors. So to maintain peace and, re uh, and reconciled re relationship, I'll invite us to look at four principles from these verses. And each principle will be accompanied by a few steps. So principle number one says, guard your hearts from evil thoughts, including anger. 
You have heard it was said that in an older generation, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with a brother, you will be subject to judgment. When Christ said these things, he is not just referring to the sixth commandment in Exodus 20 that says, do not murder. He, he is simply referring to the mis interpretation of these scriptures by the Pharisees, because the Pharisees walked around puffing and huffing and puffing, pontificating that they are good because they have not murdered an individual. But in their hearts, remember Jesus said, you Pharisees, brood of vipers, you are like whitewashed tombs. You are walking around thinking that you are all clean, but in your heart you are bitter and angry about the situation. And Jesus says, hey, friends, that's much more than act of physical murder. But are you angry at your brother or sister? Am I angry at my brother or my sister? So when, when we think about what Jesus is inviting us to, even from the passage, when you are about to offer your sacrifices. He is saying, lay it at your feet when you know your brother or sister is angry at you. Lay, pause, hit pause with that sacrifice. Go be reconciled. I tell you, I know it is challenging. The question for us today in this age of polarization is how are we doing when it comes to the relationship with anger? How am I doing? We must guard our hearts because a poisonous heart and touch and attitude. In Genesis chapter 4, you remember God said to Cain, Cain, sin is crouching at your door. Guard your heart so that you wouldn't murder your brother. So the invitation is for us to guard our hearts. We need to, here are some steps that, that you can take to be able to guard your heart. Test the root of your anger. Test the root of my anger. Is my anger a, a righteous indignation or am I just angry because of an offense that someone offended me? Or am I angry because this situation, it's out of my control? Righteous anger is concerned with injustice done towards others and dishonor towards God. While unrighteous anger is concerned only about my own personal injustice, about my personal feeling, about how I feel I have been treated, how I, have, I, I don't feel like I've been given any voice in the matter, but I tell you, God is inviting you to check your heart. And when I say inviting you, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to all of us as a church. God is inviting us as followers of Jesus. The second step is to view things from God's perspective. Remember the story of Joseph. When his brothers finally came to meet him face to face, he said to them, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And I know this might sound so cheesy and so cliche, but I tell you, if you take a stock and look at every single situation that has happened in your life or it's currently happening, in the midst of what might look like it is so discouraging, so disheartening, so challenging, God can use that for his glory. And God wants us to take a step and look at things from God's perspective. That third step, third step is we must constantly come before God in repentance and really search my heart, O God. The Psalmist Psalm 51 says, search my heart and know that uh, search my heart and purify my heart. That longing that the Psalmist cry that, O God, have mercy on me because I am an unworthy servant. The Pharisees did not consider themselves unworthy. They saw themselves as, we've made it. The second principle here is to maintain, in, in, to maintain peace, and, uh, 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 relation, and peace and reconciled relationship with one another is to guard your tongues from evil speech, including slander. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with brother will be subject to judgment. 
And whoever insults a brother will be brought before the council. And whoever says fool will be sent to a fiery hell. Wow. The motive of the heart, the tongue. James warned us about how our tongue can light up fire and destroy. James invites us to take a look at our, how the destructive nature of our tongue. Many a friendship, marriage, family, and relationship have been destroyed by unwise words. Wars have been started, therefore we must learn how to guard our tongues. I can go on and on and tell you how genocides have happened simply by the use of words, after the same negative words after over and over. Friends, there is a call. How can we guard our tongues? By slowing to speak. Slow to speak. The truly wise person restrain his words. Wise people restrain their words. Unrestrained words can destroy a person's relationship and community. Therefore, wise people always consider their words. If I say this, what will be the effect of what I am about to say? A number of years ago, I read a book. Uh, uh, it's called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire by Jim Simbala. And this is a long time ago. It's about Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. And it's about the kind of malice and gossip that was happening in the church. And Pastor Jim kept go praying. He was praying and God convicted him and said to him uh, and, and gave him this revelation that if somebody comes to him and say, do you, Brother Jim, have you heard what X and X said? He will say, pause. Let me call that brother or sister and you can say it before him. And honestly, Change the attitude of everybody in the church. The title of the book is Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. It's an old book, but I tell you, there are some nuggets and principles there that we can, we can glean from. Because if we can guard our tongue, we will solve a lot of the problems that has been ignited as a result of the words that come out of our mouth. So how do we guard our tongues? We guard our tongues by really discerning. Colossians uh, 4, 6 says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer everyone. It is challenging, but the invitation is to speak word of edification. The third principle to maintain peace and reconciled relationship is to recognize that conflict hinders our relationship with God. So then, if you bring your gift to the altar, if you are bringing yourself to the altar, and you dare remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled. The Pharisees and the scribes think that everything was centered around worship, right? Which is true. But Jesus is taking it a step further by saying, no, it's not around the ritual of worship. It's not around the rigmarole of the do's and the do's that had, or, and the Dance that happen in the, in the in the in the temple, but it is about a relationship with God. And so Jesus is saying, if you know that you or somebody is holding a grudge against you, go seek reconciliation in the immediate aftermath before you come back to me. It is challenging, friends. The world we live in, it's challenging and broken, and we're called to be different. Paul says, if I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong, a clangling cymbal. Worship without love for God and others is just a noise to God. And I'll say it again. Worship without love for God and others is just a noise to God. The third principle, the Principle number four, for peace and reconciliation. And this is all in this particular few passage of scriptures that we've read. We must seek to resolve conflict as quickly as possible. 
Because when we do not resolve con conflict or differences that arises as, as quickly as possible, what ends up happening is it festers and we start avoiding each other. And for us, most of us in North America or to be particular in Canada, we are conflict, we are conflict avoidance. If we can avoid the conflict as much as possible, but friends, loving your brother and sister means bringing the conflict in the open so that there's an awareness that there's something that is going on that is not right. And how can we together as a community, how can we maintain a peaceful relationship with others? Jesus teaches us how to prevent conflict if we can seal it off from the origin. From when it happened, if we can seal it off, I tell you, we will do ourselves a great good and we'll do the world a great se sense of pointing the world to where that, that we are truly a city on a hill. Not in a patting yourself in a on a shoulder, but because we are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We are the light of the world. We are the salt. And God is trusting you and I. So, but with, when conflict does break out, yes, conflict or disagreement will arise. We see he, the churches, the history of the early church is replete with conflict. But what they do is they seek to resolve the conflict immediately. So Jesus modeled for us how to go after all of this in his teaching by just the simple four principles that we just looked at. So remember these principles. We must guard our hearts from evil thought, including anger. We must guard our tongues from evil speech, including slander. We must recognize that discord hinders our relationship with God, and we must seek to resolve conflict as quickly as possible. Is there anyone that you harbor evil thought or anger? And when I say evil thought, I'm not talking about going to kill them. Is there anybody that you're angry with? Is there anyone that you have slandered or have said words that you wish you have taken back, you can take back? Are you in conflict with anyone? Am I in conflict with anyone? We are called to make reconciliation. And by the way, friends, reconciliation is a journey. Conflict is inevitable to any community, but it can be an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to, to go hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder. The invitation for us is to pay attention and listen. Friends, I believe that if the church can just respond to the, this few verses of scriptures and really take these principles to heart, God will take that and expound it to the glory and honor of his, his name. My prayer for us as a church is that as we seek the way of peace and reconciliation, that we will be a church that keeps short accounts, accounts with each other. And when we keep short accounts with each other, God will be glorified. Let us pray. And so God, it is impossible for us to do this by our strength, but by your power, by your enabling grace, we are able to respond Give us the grace, give us the strength, and give us the wisdom to respond to your call. Thank you for the opportunity to be reminded and be challenged by your words. We ask, O oh God, that apart from you, we can do nothing. So be glorified for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, thank you so much to Samuel and Jimmy for the teaching. Thank you so much for joining us uh, in worship today online. I want to mention a couple of reminders as there's a car alarm going off in my neighborhood. Hopefully you, you can't hear that, but if you can, oh well. Um, just want to remind you that we have many home churches that gather weekly to talk about the teaching, to pray together, to have some fun together. If you would like to join one of those, you can just go to themeetinghouse.com slash home church and search for one that's near you. Of course, I'm assuming many of you that are meeting online would prefer an online option for home church, especially if you are uh, further scattered than Southern Ontario. 
Um, when you're searching through home churches, you can just select online community and that'll show you all of the home churches that are meeting online um, and some in many different time zones. So hopefully there's one that works well for you there. Um, even if you've never been, you're always welcome to come and check one out or try a few and see which one you like the best. I want to again shout out our Discord server. Hello to our friends there. Again, please join in the chat, themeetinghouse.com slash Discord. Um, it's kind of like the live stream continued for the week. So you don't have to wait till Sunday morning in the YouTube chat. You can be chatting all week long on our Discord server. I want to also remind you about our Wednesday teaching stream. So if you're one of those that likes to get in first or likes to see the before and after less polished version of our teaching, uh, we do throw up a live stream on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, when we record our teaching for the Sunday services. So you can go to the meetinghouse.com slash Wednesday stream if you want to take part in that. Um, and also a reminder, Easter is coming. It is the 17th. So we are only 12 days from Good Friday and a couple of weeks from Easter Sunday, which is crazy. It's really early this year. Um, so we'll have more information on the services. We hope that you're able to join us for worship as we celebrate the death and the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus. Well, it was great to be with you guys today for church. I hope you have a great Sunday wherever life takes you, and we will see you again soon. God bless.